Welcome back, everybody, to the St. Louis Cardinals franchise. It is season one. We've been playing some good baseball lately, and the Cardinals are 34 and 30. There's a lot we're going to cover today. We have had a successful recovery after a 7 and 14 start to the year. We're suddenly now in the mix for first place with the pitching and hitting especially performing really well. And this is all after the trade of Paul Goldschmidt. Maybe that's what this team needed. A wake up call. Because everybody's on a hot streak now. Wilson Contreras leads us in home runs. Lars Nootbaar has been on a tear since coming off the injured list. Nolan Arenado is still the old Nolan Arenado. And while not great, we're getting enough out of our pitching staff right now. I've adjusted our left-handed lineup, too, after seeing guys like Brandon Crawford and Lars Newtbar have no issues hitting left on left. And to me, Newtbar is the guy who should be leading off every day with that 377 on base percentage. We are also going to get to the MLB draft today. I spent the first handful of sessions making sure we had plenty of options for number seven. But then we don't pick again until the third round. Now I'm trying to fill in those gaps and I'm doing some discovery, finding players like Thomas Morse, a really intriguing switch hitting first baseman that might not be on anybody's radar. And sometimes you don't find players that have the highest ceilings when you discover, but for me, it's certainly been worth it. We have a couple defensive specialist infielders who are now on the board. The goal is just to give us enough options so that we're not just guessing in the third, fourth, fifth rounds. I want to build up this team's farm system. They need it. But I do feel like we have plenty of choices now at seven. I wanted to then find more pitchers that we could draft or look at drafting in rounds three and later. Guys like Marvin James made sense to me. Bobby Rico, we talked about him last episode. We're finishing off the scouting on him, along with first baseman Thomas Morse. The team has stayed hot through the month of June, winning this game against the Pirates 9-5. Nolan Gorman goes yard, and we had five other extra base hits, as Sonny Gray has settled in having a great first year with the Cardinals. I knew we'd eventually run into a bit of a cold streak again, losing three straight. We return to week 11 of scouting. Bobby Rico is a powerful first baseman. He can play third as well. The power is his main skill, and it's really good, but nothing else looks all that promising. Thomas Morse, meanwhile, also a switch hitting first baseman, seems to have a more well-rounded bat and maybe a bit more defensive ability and can play the outfield. Marvin James has his potential here around 64 to 79. That makes him a more risky prospect, but he comes in on the board, draftable. We then decide to work on scouting Benny Matsumoto. And after that three-game losing streak, we immediately go on a five-game tear and jump into first place ahead of the Milwaukee Brewers. This is all with a 17th ranked batting average. The home runs are now more league average. Even the pitching has become league average. So we've had periods of play now where we've been one of the worst teams in baseball and now one of the best. When I traded Goldschmidt, we were bottom five in a lot of categories. Suddenly, we fixed all that. And guys like Jordan Walker have developed quite well. We go into week 12 now of scouting. Matsumoto comes in looking at a high potential range, 86 to 96. 21-year-old pitcher. I do think he'd come in pretty low overall, still be someone you'd have to develop quite a bit, but a good prospect to add to our board. And then three more prospects we worked on scouting here through week 12. Getting a couple outfielders now. Finishing off the month of June... We win a series against the Atlanta Braves, taking the first two before dropping the finale. And then we had a bit more issue with the Cincinnati Reds, who are in last place in the Central. Week 13 scouting. James Martinez will end up 85th on the board, putting him in a good spot for our second selection. He is a contact first outfielder. Willie Espinoza, 74 to 79 potential. Could be a starter down the line, but maybe not a high-level starter. Comes in 67th. 
And then Sergio Merced. If we take him, likely with our last selection, he is a contact first outfielder. In week 13, I did decide to do one more session of discovery because I felt like we had a lot of choices. I wanted to see if we could just uncover maybe a couple more outfielders that we could finish scouting in the last week. And at this stage, late June, we're tied for first with the Brewers. Had a couple bad series there at the end, but that is a 17 and 11 month as we head into July, losing 3 of 4 to start and then losing our second baseman, Nolan Gorman. He broke his leg. He'll miss one to two months. And that's our first major injury in quite some time. And Gorman had been putting together a year that was comparable to what he was doing a year ago. He seems to be maybe a lower average, but decently high slugging second baseman. A lot more power than many other second basemen have. We're going to have Brandon Crawford slot into that second base role. And then with no outfielders on the bench, it is the perfect time to bring back Dylan Carlson to the MLB roster. And upon returning... He would homer in his first game back against the Washington Nationals in a 12-4 win. This was a three-home run day. Newt Barr had the other two. We had four runs each scored in the seventh and eighth innings as St. Louis gets to 49-42. and The next day would give us win number 50. And now we're approaching the All-Star break. The final series comes against the Chicago Cubs, and this next game we're going to go through happens to be the same day as the MLB draft. It's also a chance for us to see Cubs pitcher in his first year with Chicago, Shota Imanaga. As we have Miles Michaelis taking the mound, and regression has not been kind to him this year, really not having a great season, but this team was built with veteran pitchers, and this is what we knew was likely going to happen. But let's go through this game. We've got the Cubs and Cardinals, both teams in the mix for this NL Central lead along with the Brewers. The Pirates aren't even out of it, but Cubs trying to close the gap ahead of the All-Star break. Can Miles Michaelis give us a good showing? Maybe work on that 13.9 strikeout rate and the 526 ERA. Here is a look at the Cubs offense, and it's a decent unit. There's definitely some star power here, but it's been more of an average offense this season. Top of the first. After a base hit, Cody Bellinger draws a four-pitch walk. And Patrick Wisdom, with a base hit into right field, gets the scoring started for Chicago as Mike Talkman slides in safely. The Cubs get runners at the corners. And Michaelis can't control the curveball. That goes all the way to the backstop, brings home the second run. Michaelis did not look comfortable early on. Contreras smothers this one and throws out the runner at third base. We'll take our outs, I guess, any way we can get them. But now facing Shota Imanaga, who's been an outstanding starter through 19 starts. We go bottom two. I've been really impressed this year with the development of Jordan Walker. I feel a lot of big steps are being taken. Three and two. How about a drive the other way? Headed to the bullpen and gone! Number 11 for Jordan Walker. Cardinals get on the board. We go top three. Nico Horner, base hit into right field, leads off the inning. With good speed, he looks to take second and does so successfully. Mike Talkman then bounces one through the infield and Horner works his way home. A simple base hit scores into a run pretty quickly. Later in the inning, two on, Seiya Suzuki into right field. Cubs want their fourth run, but Lars Newtbar throws out Talkman at the plate. Defense again helping out Michaelis, but it is 3-1. We go bottom three with the struggling Joe Adele, but maybe some curveballs left over the plate are exactly what he needs to get things on track. He launches home run number three. We make it a one-run game. Adele's development this year has been mostly with his defense and some of the secondary hitting skills like vision and discipline. 
His contact has not moved, and his power is actually down. There was some early offensive action in this game. It was exciting, but the pitchers then would settle in. Imanaga had a couple mistakes we capitalized on, but didn't make many more mistakes afterwards. And even Michaelis had a couple really good frames. When he can locate his pitches down and keep the ball in the infield, then good things can happen. Michaelis would ultimately pitch five innings in this game, giving up seven hits, two walks, giving up three runs, and getting three strikeouts. At this stage of his career, that's got to be what you're hoping he can do. Imanaga, meanwhile, would go six innings. He'd only collect three strikeouts, but only allowed four base runners and the two runs. Then it was time to see what these bullpens would do. Zach Thompson comes out for the Cardinals and served up to Dansby Swanson. He hammers a changeup out to center as the Cubs take a 4-2 advantage. Maybe that's just my mistake. I'm not sure our bullpen arms are good enough to go longer than three outs in most cases. So we brought in Andre Palante. And you know with that slider and curveball, when those pitches are on, he's going to give us some good outings. He cleaned up the seven, getting a couple strikeouts. But one guy who I've been really impressed with this year is Ryan Fernandez, who entered as a Rule 5 pick, 56 overall, but this guy deserves to play. I've been impressed with him locating his pitches in the limited time I've seen him so far, and he just continues to have good outings. He's still sitting at 10-plus strikeouts per nine innings, and his play this year has already taken him from a 56 overall to a 59. I know that is still low, but there's no mistaking that he's one of our best middle relievers right now. We'll take this game into the ninth inning. Giovanni Gallegos comes in, and with a runner on second, base hit from Dansby Swanson. Newt Bar fires home and cannot save the run. The Cubs take a three-run lead into the bottom of the ninth with excellent closer Edbert Alzali trying to shut it down. 22 of 24 and save attempts this season. And the inning opens. That's Wilson Contreras to left center field. He gets his first hit of the day. It is a double. Jordan Walker is next. Alzali falls behind. The count goes full and Walker fights off a good cutter. He had to fight off a tough pitch in his home run at bat earlier and ultimately he draws a walk. That brings the tying run to the plate in Mason Wynn. Wynn bounces one through the right side. We hold Contreras but the bases are loaded suddenly with nobody out. Bottom nine. That brings up Brendan Donovan, two for three on the day. He bounces one, Swanson lays out, and fires to first to get him. A run does score, and the other two base runners now move up to second and third. One away, now Brandon Crawford. What a season he's having. Down two strikes, he pops up in foul territory. And we're down to our final out. And it is Dylan Carlson. 0 for 3 on the day. Alzali's 21st pitch. Line drive. Base hit left field. One run scores. Here comes win. Tie ball game. Dylan Carlson in the clutch. And this ain't even the A's franchise. Already one of my favorite moments from this series. We pull off the three-run comeback bottom nine, capped off by Dylan Carlson, and this game would see extra innings. Now they've got to deal with our star closer. Nico Horner leads off the 10th. It's flied to Newt Bar, and it's an out with no advance. Now we're in control. Mike Talkman. Blown away at 102. Two down. And Cody Bellinger waving at the slider at strike three. Bottom 10 going for the win.
Newt Bar shows and lays down the bunt. We move that winning run to third base. Nolan Arenado celebrating the most average fly ball you could possibly hit. Here comes Joe Adele to win it. And the Cardinals cap off a three-run comeback with an extra inning walk-off winner. And that's why I love playing MLB The Show. Welcome to the Cardinals franchise, everybody. It's still early, but I'm having a really good time. Thank you for the support in the first five episodes. And if you would please leave a like on the video, I'd very much appreciate it. I'm excited about the content I'm working on right now, and I really want to have a great franchise here with St. Louis. And we got some important stuff to talk about today. We're about to hit the all-star break, and we're 52 and 44. There's still one more game, but we do have the MLB draft to go through today. Before we do, I just want to update you on where some of our players are. Jordan Walker had a couple standout moments for me in that last game. He had the big home run early going opposite field and then helped draw that walk in the ninth inning. We're seeing really good development this year. He has significantly boosted his power against lefties. We're seeing the vision get better, the batting clutch, and even a little defense. Defense still has the furthest way to go, but I'm willing to stay patient if he's hitting the way he is. His numbers are definitely down from last year, but with a player so young, I think you really want to see where the numbers are at the end, if he can go through a hot streak or two. But even right now, for a guy at 21 years old, I'm happy with his performance and the fact that he's developing. Mason Wynn at shortstop is a rookie at 22 years old, and he's not showing much power. That's actually declining. And if that got more out of hand, I would consider optioning him to AAA. He does not have any options used. But right now, I think that it's good for him to just get this overall development. And I'm not sure he's ever going to have elite offense just because his ratings are so spread out and there's nothing that's going to stand out right now, like he's not going to be a high average, high on base, high power guy. So it's harder to say where his offense will end up. But right now he's slashing 237, 284, 351, and it's only his rookie year. I'm not sure how much longer Brandon Crawford can keep this up. He is down to a 63 overall, but his numbers hide that really well he's been one of our most valuable hitters so far and while the team is in a good spot right now what i wonder with guys like crawford lance lynn and a lot of the veteran talent i worry about the length of the season because regression is going to continue and i don't expect our hot play to stick around forever over may and june we went 35 and 20. Our months so far have been either way under 500 or way above. And I wonder if we start to play more average, say coming out of the All-Star break, if we're going to struggle to keep this up throughout the rest of the year, given how tight the NL Central currently is. I want to start talking about prospects as well as we get into the second half of year one. Here are our top prospects right now. You've got three starting pitchers. Two outfielders in Victor Scott and Joshua Baez. What I see here with our top 20 is there isn't a lot of infield talent, and especially guys who project as starters and high-quality starters. Thomas Seguis, if I'm saying that correctly, to me looks more like a platooning bench player. But maybe he could go further. He's only 21. I just see that C potential and know it's going to limit him somewhat. Josh Baez, he's a C potential outfielder and his career could literally go anywhere from here. Victor Scott, we know what he's about, B potential, but probably not going to be an elite offensive player, at least for the first few years of his career. We really want to find some position players that can be building blocks for this team's future because right now the organization just doesn't have that in the minor leagues. Right now, we have three of the MLB's top 20 pitching prospects. 
We then have two closers that crack the top 20 there. For infielders in the top 20, we have an A-ball catcher in Leonardo Bernal. And the aforementioned Thomas Seguis, that's the 12 second baseman. And for outfielders, it's the two guys I already talked about briefly. So let's get into our first MLB draft. Again, we're missing a second round pick this year, so we need to make number seven count, and then hopefully find a way to get some good value with our later picks. I think the biggest issue for me with our seventh pick is how to separate all the pitchers that I have clustered here. So highest on our board right now is Billy Murray, and if the MLB only has him as the 21st, he might be there when we pick. He's 18 years old, the potential range is 81 to 96, but it looks like early on he's going to struggle with control, he's going to struggle with the home runs, and his main calling card is limiting walks. I think I'd like a little bit more for high-end ability there, but that's not going to come until he develops. Steve Castilla is then ranked fourth on our board. The MLB is even lower on him. Strikeouts are something he doesn't seem to have as a strength right now. Maybe down the road it could be. He projects to be really solid and well-rounded. Where I struggle is then factoring in Daniel Gomez Phelps, who already has the four years college experience. And therefore, we have tighter ranges here in scouting if you want to buy into all these numbers. 90 to 95 potential is perfect. And maybe he's even closer to the bigs than a lot of the other prospects. Not that I think that's too important, but it has to have some level of importance. That's a couple years, maybe less, of waiting for a guy to contribute. Then there's Wes Stratton, who I would have just a little bit below where I have Gomez Phelps. And then the only non-pitcher I had in this range was Jason Waller. And I like Waller a lot. Very similar to Aaron Don from the A's franchise. But I feel like the pitchers are a better fit and offer the most upside here at 7. A few of these guys will likely be drafted, making our decision a little bit easier in some ways. We might see Enfield and Mercer off the board, but I think that between Murray, Castilla, and Gomez Phelps, if that's what it comes down to, it's going to be tough. I'm trying to factor in, okay, this guy might have high potential. Does he have a skill set that allows him to smoothly get there? And I just worry with some of the weaknesses on Billy Murray that he might have a longer road because he could get roughed up with his play style early in his career. So let's get the 2024 MLB draft underway. Cleveland has the first pick and they're expected to take Cosmo Fernandez. So I didn't do any scouting on him. Sometimes I just don't bother with players that shouldn't be there for us. Wow, it's Arden Mercer number one. In the last game, I'm not sure if there were any clips that showed it, but on the bottom ticker, they were saying that Fernandez was expected to go number one. And he was the, the number one prospect on the board. So already a bit of a curveball being thrown here by the Guardians. Now at number two, we've got... The Reds going with Cosmo Fernandez instead. So just a one pick difference. And then at three, I like this new uh, reveal screen too. It is Dudley Enfield. Three pitchers to start the draft this year. Now we just wait for our turn. We got three more players that'll come off the board. We'll see if any are high on ours. Here are the A's taking Wes Stratton. It would probably be like my fourth pitcher out of our board currently. The White Sox have a lot of work to do. I recommend them for those of you that want to do a franchise. And they go with DGP. And I think that if he had been there at seven, he might have been my pick. Roger Correa then goes to the Royals. And we are on the clock. And we've got Billy Murray and Steve Castilla still right there. Murray, I do worry about some of these skills and if they'll get to a good point. I do think there's a fair amount of risk with him. 
Castilla, meanwhile, he might be more well-rounded, but with a notable weakness early on with the strikeouts. But it's projected to be fine down the road. Murray is expected to always struggle with control and break, making him maybe more of a fastball changeup guy. Does have a five-pitch mix right off the bat. Castilla, meanwhile, has a, a mid-90s fastball splitter changeup slider. He is higher on the board, but I think at this point, Castilla, who might have a slightly lower stealing, slightly lower starting point, I just think I'm more comfortable with his skill set and for him to develop ultimately into that high ceiling pitcher. I wouldn't be surprised if Murray has higher potential, but I just, based on the info we have, like the chances of Castilla to get there better and possibly with less risk along the way. And our first pick of the series will be the righty, Steve Castilla. He was 41st on the MLB board, but our scouting really liked him. And we'll find out if that was a wise pick for us. And of course, then we want to see where Murray ends up. And it won't be with the Angels. They end up taking Daryl Good instead. But now we're not on the clock for a while. No second round pick after, I believe, the Sunny Gray signing. So it's not until like 87 overall. Jason Waller ends up going at 11 to the Detroit Tigers. And I expect him to be someone that we end up hearing a lot from later in the series. The Cubs take Martin Corona. He was not on my radar because he was in that range where probably wouldn't make sense at seven. And we were never going to get him in the second round. Billy Murray goes to the Miami Marlins and they have a history of developing starting pitching. So here's their next project. The Brewers then go with Jason Bridges, who we did not scout. Looks like uh, a weird player, like no power but just hits lefties well, doesn't hit righties very well, might be a good defender, ultimately was very low on the MLB board, so that's a bit of a head scratcher. I'm waiting for us to approach our pick, and I'm trying to figure out my plan for our next selection, but Bobby Rico, I would not expect to be our next pick. He is like an all-or-nothing prospect, and all of his chips are in that power basket right now. I can't see me taking this one-dimensional of a player with our second pick of this series. To a degree, I try to follow the board, but I know that a lot of these rankings are pretty simple. And if it's just mainly looking at projected overall or something, then I know that the overall formula, especially in MLB, isn't really the best one and it struggles with guys who have these like really high ratings and really low ratings combined. Like guys like Luis Arias can be 72 overall in MLB because he's just really elite at contact. Everything else is terrible. I don't think that following those numbers all the time leads you the right way. So I've always been someone that looks into the ratings and now I'm more so factoring in, okay, if I'm taking an 18 year old, they have to get eventually to being a high level player that road sometimes is tricky if there are certain weaknesses that i think could take extra time to overcome or it adds an element of risk i'd like to avoid because there's always me comparing two players to each other and the risks can be different that's how we ended up with castilla as our first pick not because billy murray was a bad prospect i actually find that mlb probably has the least useful overall rating if you're trying to use it as a shortcut to determine if a player is good bad worth pursuing i think that you need to like forget about overall in this game and that's even more magnified when you factor in that guys can outperform or underperform their overall so when i'm like signing free agents and whatnot i'm looking at what they've done recently because if there's an 83 overall, but he's on the decline and hitting like 222 and his numbers show like a three-year trend of decline, then I know overall there is a meaningless number. So the board is definitely shrinking and now we're approaching 83. I thought my pick was 78, 
Last time I did a draft, of course, was with the Oakland A's, but no, they're going to take Brooks Moore, and we're waiting here at 83. Bobby Rico is available, as is Nathan Martins, who is 57 on our board. Alex Feliz, who looks to have uh, really high-level velocity, 81 to 91 potential on him. Willie Espinoza, a little bit lower on the ceiling with him. James Martinez. This is actually a consideration, I think, with this pick. I even think Norris Sullivan's interesting with how well-rounded, if all goes well, he could end up being. So here we are, 83 overall. Brian Bell just went. He was on my board. Yeah, we definitely lost a lot of our uh, potential choices here. Rico remains the highest on our board that is currently available. Wait a minute. I have 20 seconds to make a pick? Well, in that case, I did feel pretty good about Sullivan. Thomas Morse? Not bad there. I didn't expect to be rushed like this. I thought I had a couple minutes. I'm going to take Norris Sullivan here at 83. So a switch hitting outfielder. I thought he had a well-rounded skill set. And I love well-rounded outfielders that can do a little bit of everything. Like give me a guy who can hit 270, 20 homers, play solid defense. That's my kind of player right there. That definitely was more rushed than I expected to be, but that's about where he made sense. And as the board shrinks, I'm more and more interested in then taking Rico when I would consider him to then be, compared to alternatives, one of the best choices remaining. Certainly would have a high ceiling as a power hitter. The modern game loves those power hitters, regardless if they can do anything else. Willie Espinosa just went, and I wonder if we could see much more of our starting pitcher options gone by then. I scouted more pitchers, hoping we'd have plenty of options here in this range, but there's only a couple left I'd really want to take. I have no idea what to expect from Benny Matsumoto, but he's 21 years old and has that 86 to 96 potential. His like present ratings and everything do not look promising. But if he has a high potential range now, getting into the third, fourth, fifth round range, I'm okay chasing potential. I was way pickier early on. Bobby Rico just went at 95 to the Mariners. I wasn't sure really with these Discovery guys because I didn't do a lot of this in the Ace franchise with him being 52nd on our board, not ranked MLB. I didn't know where he'd land. But now he lands with the Seattle Mariners, so we're... I thought for a second, like, oh, we're going to see him because I'm still, like, my brain thinks I'm with the Oakland Athletics still. It's been a while. A lot of uh, stuff to unlearn there. I wanted to compare him to Thomas Morse because Morse is a lot more well-rounded and more of a lefty masher with flexibility to play the outfield, but I don't think he'd play it particularly well. James Martinez just went to the Twins. It was kind of a toss-up with him and Sullivan there at 83. I end up going with Sullivan. Martinez showed the 68 to 83 potential range. Sullivan, 69 to 81. But, of course, that well-rounded skill set was uh, a bit of a tiebreaker. While Martinez projects as basically the same hitting profile as we have with Victor Scott. And one thing, too, that knocked down Martinez for me like, he's a high-contact guy, but he's not a high-speed guy. I like those things to go together, especially for an outfielder. And speed is actually what looks to be one of the best things for Norris Sullivan. All right, we know our pick is coming up here in uh, a couple seconds, so we still have a couple starting pitchers out there. Thomas Morse at 99. This wouldn't be a bad time. And then... Still wondering about uh, Benny Matsumoto and if this is uh, worth our while. It might be a long road for him. He projects to have 49 to 59 potential or uh, overall right away. But if I can only take one more pitcher, I mean, he's the only guy there that is left. But I really want Thomas Morse, and I have a feeling I can't have both of these players. I'm going to go with Matsumoto here, just off of the ceiling. He was ranked on the MLB board, whereas Morse wasn't. 
So I think that there's a higher likelihood Matsumoto's gone before our next pick compared to Morse. But now the board is only showing five players remaining. Approaching our selection, the A's take Christopher Martin. We have four players remaining on our board. As long as the Royals don't take one, we'd be guaranteed to get somebody I had interest in. Thomas Morse is my favorite player right now. But Miguel Lopez is also there if we want somebody who projects to have some power. Lopez is kind of intriguing here because while there's a lot low, he has decent speed. That power shows up, of course, and might be an average defender still. But Morse, to me, is still the higher ceiling player. The Nationals ahead of us take Blake Erdman. And we're going to be selecting Thomas Morse. The first baseman right here. And he's one of those players I discovered very late in the process. So that discovery has definitely been something I want to look at even more. I really enjoyed scouting this year. It was probably my favorite year of scouting. Felt more comfortable with the, just all the options you have. And then the prospects themselves were more fun to uncover. Because one of the issues in the previous games with the uh, archetypes and how commonly you'd see the same skill sets. Well, I wanted to find like power hitting outfielders and I couldn't. So it would lead me to continuously scout new players because I wasn't finding what I was looking for. I'd spend all this time looking for something that wouldn't appear. Whereas now I don't have to work as hard. Oh, Miguel Lopez just went at 153 to the Yankees. He's a lefty with some power, so down the road, I'm sure we'll see him be hitting 30 home runs in Yankee Stadium. Sergio Merced just went, but I'm not sure he would have been our pick with our last selection anyway. There are some other outfielders here I'm interested in. I did scout Richard Hughes, and he looks a little more well-rounded than many. And although I didn't finish the scouting, I still have interest in Michael Atkinson and then Morris Rose. Both have exceptional speed. And I don't know, when I don't finish the scouting profile, it's like, well, there's still an element of unknown. Oh, Atkinson just went. It's like, I know Hughes has 72 to 77 potential. Morris Rose unscouted fully. His potential could be a little bit better. That was more so the case with Atkinson, but the Braves are going to turn him into a future all-star. So, I guess that's out of the question. Richard Hughes just went to the Rockies, meaning I have one player on my board. But, I can add someone to the board here. Diego Casto. I know I had discovered him fairly late. Oh, Morris Rose just went. So, good thing I had Casto as an option there. He looks to have, you know, pretty good defense. I just didn't scout him uh, fully at all, so... Diego Castro is our last selection today. And the draft has come to an end. I'm pretty happy with how that played out. I felt prepared for number seven. And then outside of the clock running out faster than I expected, I felt prepared for the rest of the draft as well. I'm assuming it's the same feature as in last year's game. So we'll not know the ratings until like August 1st or 2nd when the Signing deadline passes. We do end up winning our last game ahead of the deadline, meaning we go in 53 and 44. We win this series against the Cubs, a 7 to 3 finale. Sonny Gray goes 8, getting his 11th win of the year. We're not going to do the All Star game this year. I just don't think it's the most exciting year to do it. I'd rather move on. But here are the All-Stars nonetheless. Ryan Helsley does make it. Oh yeah, I was right to skip it this year because he was our only All-Star. Not even Goldschmidt ended up making it. Wow. I'm sorry, I forgot about Wilson Contreras. We had two. Contreras made it as the third catcher. The Angels want to offer us a trade. All right. I gave the CPU the green light to start trading. And they want... Uh, Two low potential, C potential outfielders for Jake Marisnik. Pass. 
But now we can look at offering contracts to our draft picks. Beginning with Steve Castilla. He signs right away for that $4.7 million. We then sign Norris Sullivan, Benny Matsumoto, and our final pick, Diego Casto. I just have to wait a little bit longer to offer a contract to Morse, but that shouldn't be an issue. So it was a 53-44 and 44 first half for St. Louis. We are in first place right now in the Central, but I have no interest in in trying to add to this team at the deadline. I don't think that's good for our long-term plans. Lance Lynn is one guy I do think that it would be nice to replace. The advanced numbers like him a little bit more than the surface numbers, but he's not good. I might even be interested in giving Zach Thompson his spot in the rotation and seeing if he's just better. Thompson... Hasn't been much better out of the bullpen. I'm willing to give that a try. And at AAA, I don't think there's anyone to bring up. I mean, that would already be on the 40-man or anything. I'm not going to just bring someone up for, for fun. I guess Drew Rom. We could try Drew Rom. I have our top prospects down at AA right now. And perhaps we could see some promotions here in the second half. But these guys are all 66, 67 overall. So I've tried to let them grind at double A and put up really good numbers as we have seen from Dylan Lesko. Tink Hens has also been quite impressive. Takoa Roby has had more struggles though. So I don't think he'll be going to triple A at any point this year. But coming out of the deadline, our first series is against the Atlanta Braves, and we lose a 2-1 game immediately. But we did just get our entire draft class signed really quickly. We are swept by the Atlanta Braves. We just beat them in a series within the last month. But now Atlanta comes in, ready to show who the class of the National League is. We go on the road then to face Pittsburgh and split the first two. And in the finale, Cardinals win it. Then we take on the Nationals at home. We drop this series. Next up, we have the Texas Rangers. And it's the trade deadline. We're in first place still. I've explored a couple potential trades here, but ultimately we're going to stay put. And I'm not going to be trading away, you know, guys we already have. And I already planned on holding guys like Sonny Gray, Nolan Arenado. So let's just see where the rest of this season goes. We're going to stand pat and lose another series. We've now lost three of our four series post All-Star break. This is our first month since April with a losing record. We went 11-13 and 13 in July. In that time, the Cubs have gained some ground. Now a game and a half back of us and the Brewers, and the Pirates are still a hot streak away from being in the mix too. We lose the first game of August to the Chicago Cubs. Now we're only a half game up. But this is also the chance. Ooh, I like those Wrigleyville uniforms. I think I saw some people that didn't. But uh, I am a fan, even though it doesn't look like an MLB uniform. But now, everybody, we have a chance to look at the ratings of our first draft picks in the series. Here we go. And the potentials don't look too bad, considering we only had one pick in the first 82 selections. Steve Castilla looks to start his career with 87 potential. So part of his overall is going to be heavily influenced by 93 stamina. Pitching clutch is on the lower end. That's one thing I'll probably look to specifically train. But here is our first draft pick of the series. And with that high potential, could easily become one of our top of the rotation arms. And certainly now there's a lot of guys. He's at 68 overall. He has higher overall currently than Hence, Lesko, Roby. All those guys are clustered now. So you could see in a few years a really young, pretty solid rotation with these guys. Norris Sullivan, though, 76 potential. He is 
you know, solid with contact early on. And I mean, 71 overall at 19 years old is quite impressive. And you know, we've seen in real life guys like Nolan Shanwell make it to the bigs within his first like couple months of being a pro or whatever it was. He was a pro last year after being drafted. I think I'm more willing with guys like Sullivan who already look mostly developed to just get him at the bigs. Maybe they're never going to be a star, but they're about as good as they're ever going to be now. Let's see if they can contribute. Sullivan, decent bat. And then also a little bit of speed. This to me is a skill set that could play at the bench before too long. Benny Matsumoto, though. I was right to take a chance on his potential. 98. 61 overall. Home run per nine already looks solid. Velocity and break are on the higher end, too. Now, adding Matsumoto, Kistia, and Lesko. In only a handful of episodes, I've already changed our pitching outlook for the future. We round it out with Thomas Morse. 71 overall. He, too, could be somebody that makes it, like, if he has a chance at the bigs, it'll be possibly early. Because his bat's already kind of there. And then Diego Casto. More of a defensive specialist, not as ready to contribute. The other thing you have to keep in mind is we don't have the strongest farm system. We have a lot of older veteran talent. So the guys competing for playing time against a guy like Morse aren't as strong as they could be a few years from now. Opening the door for this class to have a potential early impact. I would expect from this group, Castilla probably makes it to the bigs first, but I would say Sullivan has a chance. It just might not be as a starter, but there's a chance that he is basically an injury away from making it to the majors as early as next season. Overall, I like the way this draft turned out when you consider we had no second round pick. But what about guys I chose not to take? You'll have to let me know, too, these unsigned players, will they appear in the next draft class or will they be appearing in the free agent pool? Because there's a few that have gone unsigned. Brian Sanchez, he came in like in the 20s or 30s on our board, but there is some stuff to like here with a strong arm and athleticism with power. Miguel Lopez, I had interest in taking him late. Definitely can mash righties a good bit. Has some pop. Daniel Gomez Phelps. I think he would have been my pick at seven if I had like my pick of everybody. Because he was already 22. Had the high potential. To me, you're getting a high potential player while skipping some steps along the way and reducing your risk. So he's got a higher ceiling potentially than Steve Castilla, but was off the board before I had a chance to take him. No way they missed signing the number one pick in the draft. What? Arden Mercer did not sign with Cleveland. What happens? That's crazy. Jason Waller, 86 to the Tigers. He should be really good and it shouldn't take very long. James Martinez. I kind of... Had to make my decision really quickly with our second pick, who I would take. And we ended up with similar potentials. Martinez, though, not much power, not a ton of speed. So he could be a high-contact outfielder, but I think that those weaknesses matter to me a bit in the outfield. I feel you need to check a couple of boxes there, like contact, power, speed, be at least two in a good spot. Good pick here, and West Stratton to the Oakland A's. They get an 89 overall pitcher right away in their rebuild efforts. Oh, well, Marvin James ended up a bit worse than I expected. So, 70 potential, 70 overall. Might as well call him up right away. Michael Atkinson, 77 overall. Considered him late. 49 overall is a long way to develop from. Billy Murray ended up going to the Marlins. I passed on him. I knew there was a chance he'd have better potential. And he indeed does by a couple, and he's 73 overall. He's a lot further along right now than Steve Castilla. I was a little bit scared off by the home run per nine, which 51 here right away is not that bad. 
Pitching clutch at 37, control at 39. Those, to me, were a little scary. For our division rivals, the Cubs took Mitch Corona early and eventually Jack Kearns at 94 potential. By year five, he might be a superstar. We'll see. Wow. That level of defensive ability for a 58 overall, I was not seeing that in last year's game. Then we have the Reds. They took a lot of C potential in this class, including Cosmo Fernandez. No way. Well, that's why the Guardians may be passed. I didn't see that coming. Ouch. With the number two pick. And the Brewers take a 90 potential outfielder right away. They already have some studs there with Churio and Freelick, Yelich, and eventually Jason Bridges. And then some solid picks later on, including an 82 potential center fielder in Drew Thiel. Pirates, Jesse Wilson, Antonio Velez, Steve Cosmo. So some good B potential additions here for the Pirates. I wonder when they're going to be playing Paul Skeens at the majors. I don't think it'll take too long. Velez probably isn't all that far away either from being in consideration. Wow, Cosmo can play it all. Good defender, high potential. But our first pick was Steve Castilla. And okay, his pitching clutch is around what uh, Murray's was. His home run per nine is better. His control is better. But now we'll see who turns into the better pro. And maybe better than both will be Benny Matsumoto. We'll just have to see where the franchise goes. But six episodes in, I love the progress we're making. And before I end today's video, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, I juggle multiple series at a time, and these series end up lasting a while in real time. Like, I did the A's franchise for 12 months, because that's just how long the project took. I've been thinking a lot lately about, like, improvements I could make to upload schedule and just the frequency of videos and how I can make this all work. What to me makes sense when a series is fresh like this is that it becomes kind of the focus of what I'm doing. And I want a lot of my uploads to be this series. I don't think it really should be the same amount as, say, the Raiders franchise. I think that with series like the Raiders or even the Saints on my main channel, it's time to start thinking about how I can do episodes differently and still deliver that franchise and that story. But maybe... I drop uh, the episode frequency, but do more in those videos or the videos are just different because maybe then I'm going to say, all right, we're doing one Raiders video this week. How can I make the best, most fulfilling episode for that week? Well, I might then post three episodes or four episodes in the Cardinals series. And eventually when the NFL season comes around, I assume I'll still be doing the cards. Well, then it's the Cardinals' turn to kind of have maybe less frequent videos, but maybe they're videos that cover more ground or they're longer videos. Or does that make sense? So right now, I want to be hitting this series hard. You guys are enjoying it. You're showing up, supporting it, and I want to deliver another good franchise. And ultimately, I, want to, I wanted to do things differently than the A's series. And I'm just trying to optimize, you know, everything that I've been doing. So I hope you enjoyed today's video. I thought like the start of this video was very efficient. We covered in seven minutes what could have easily been basically a whole episode worth of scouting and simulating. Not to mention that game I played ended up being an absolute banger thanks to Dylan Carlson's first heroic moment for us in this franchise. Now we got our first draft class under our belts. We got two months to go this season. And we'll see if the postseason is going to be a part of year one. I don't know right now with us having a bad or a rough July and going into August now. If we don't step it up, we're going to be on the outside looking in. But that is going to do it for today, everybody. Thank you for your support. I would love your feedback down in the comment section. Again, Please leave a like on the video. That's one way to help out the series and the channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And the Redbirds will be returning for much more this week. Have a great day.